Our guest today on the Ryerson Negotiation Project is the Honorable Bob Webb. Welcome, Bob. Thank you, David. Great to be here. Our guest has many, many achievements. He's a graduate of the University of Toronto in Arts and Law. He's a Rhodes Scholar. He's a very able and distinguished labor lawyer. He was a member of parliament. He became the leader of the New Democratic Party in the province of Ontario. Uh, subsequent to that, he worked with uh, David Peterson, I believe, uh, whereby they assigned an accord, his two respectful leaders, to end the 42-year rule of Tory government in the province of Ontario. Then in 1990, our guest became Ontario's 21st Premier. He was defeated in 1995, and then he resigned from the New Democratic Party in 1998. After politics, you went back to practicing law, you wrote books, you did special assignments, whether they be with Tainted Blood or in the field of education, and you were an enormous help to a variety of different charities across the country. In 2006, our guest returned to politics and contested the leadership of the Liberal Party of Canada. He was not successful. But in 2008, you won a federal by-election in the constituency of Toronto Centre. In 2009, you once again uh, made a run for the leadership of the Liberal Party of Canada. You were not successful at that time. But in 2011, after a major setback for the Liberal Party of Canada, you became the interim leader of the party. By all accounts, your tenure as leader of the Liberal Party of, of Canada was a very successful run. In 2013, a new leader was elected, and you opted to leave politics at that time, and now you became chief negotiator for the James Bay Area First Nation. What a career. <laughs> it's not over yet. <laughs> no, it's not over yet. <laughs> So tell us what you've learned over the years in terms of your approach to negotiations, because you've had to deal with some very, very tough eyes. I think of that uh, when you were Premier and the economy was tanking, which happened before you did become Premier. Uh, there was major, major changes at the federal level in terms of how the pie was to be divided, and Ontario had a bare brunt of all of those changes. So how did you cope with those things and what have you learned from those experiences? Well, I mean, I think, uh, first of all, I, I'm, a, I'm one of those people who believes that um, we, we all negotiate our way through life. Uh, and negotiation is not something that's foreign to anybody. We grow up, uh, we are negotiating with our parents. Uh, we're negotiating with our brothers and sisters. We're negotiating with our schoolmates. Uh, we are we're involved in the process of negotiation. Negotiation is really about how to deal with people, how to deal with conflict, how to deal with the world around you. And so we're con we're in a constant act of negotiation. I don't believe it's foreign. I mean, it's not like people say, "Well, you're a negotiator." We're all negotiators in some in some way, shape, or form. The key thing is to I think a couple of things I really believe in. One is Try as much as you can to treat everybody with respect, and that's not easy because some people don't respect you, and and you know you, you you can start out, you know, feeling very chippy and getting into it, negotiating is not about arguing; it's about trying to under trying to look to where the difference lies and how to get to a better place that is seen as being in your mutual self-interest. So to that extent, I suppose I'm a believer in you know, what they call principled negotiation or trying to move beyond just negotiation as a matter of extracting as much as you can out of the other guy, which I don't think is very helpful. But it's a way of looking at, at, at dealing with other people and situations. Uh, I think you also have to be learn how to be unafraid of conflict. Um, could you elaborate on that? I, conflict is also natural to life. We, we are always, in a way, as we, as we try to assert ourselves in the world and uh, get our own identity, in a sense we're in conflict. We're a little bit in conflict with our parents' expectations of what we're going to do or what we're going to be like or how we're going to behave. 
So kids, adolescents, you know, young people are always in a state of some kind of, you know, conflict. And I think as Canadians particularly, um, we, we often talk about well, let's, let's try to resolve conflict. Well, I'm, I'm a big believer that a lot of time we're trying to manage conflict and we're trying to figure out a way to, to, to not to resolve it for all time necessarily, although that's great if you can do that, but really trying to manage it. And um, try to avoid taking things personally, which is, again, very difficult to do. A lot of times in a discussion, somebody will say something horrible because they're trying to assert their position. And you, you can make the mistake of taking that very personally. Uh, and I, I, I think we, we, we need to understand that asserting yourself is natural and good but up to a point, and then it becomes a point of saying, how well do you listen? Which is my next point. Listening is really important. And really trying to understand what is, what is the other person or the other, other force or the other group, what, what are they saying? What are they really saying? Because sometimes what they say is, is not actually what they're saying, if you get my point. They, they, they're, I'm listening. They're afraid, they're afraid to... They're sometimes afraid of expressing themselves. They're afraid of saying, and you need to know, uh, well, how bad is it? Tell me, tell me everything. Don't just tell me the good parts. Tell me the whole, the whole thing so I can learn from that. Um, and uh, never give up uh, the, it, it requires real tenacity and a real determination to kind of keep reminding everybody of what the consequences of not managing this thing appropriately are going to be, what can happen. Not in an exaggerated way, not in a rhetorical way, but just saying, well, we're all going to be better off if we try to get to this better, better place. Humor helps a huge amount. Uh, finding ways of, you know, getting to know the other guy. I mean, what, you mentioned the government. I'll tell you just a story about, about um, uh, a negotiation. I, one of the first things that happened when I was premier was that the, the word came from um, Kimberly Clark, the big pulp and paper company, global company, that had a major operation in Capus Casey in Northern Ontario. Uh, and uh, the production of the newsprint facility there went to the New York Times. It, it was the village, the town of Capus Casey was set up as a model community by the New York Times in the 1920s. Uh, so there was a deep kind of connection between those papers and and uh, and us and the industry. Anyway, he came in and he, there's a guy called Darwin Smith was the president of the company, an American. And Mr. Smith uh, said, you know, Premier, nice to meet you. Uh, I'm I have to, we have to close down the facility. Uh, da 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 da, and bing bing bing, and thank you very much. And it was a very kind of abrupt conversation. I said, Mr. Smith, before you go, you have to understand this is not going to happen the way you you think it's going to happen. We're we're going to find some solutions here, and we we can't we can't afford to lose this industry, and we can't afford to lose these jobs, and it, we're going to try to find a solution. He said so. So. At first, the, the, the government bureaucrats and the, and the ministers and deputy ministers and so on started to handle and try to deal with you know, ways out of the, <coughs> the issue. But it became clear that uh, Mr. Smith himself was not happy, that he, that he felt that, that, that the company had a right to do what it wanted to do. Uh, and the government had some levers in terms of other things that we could do that would make life more difficult for Mr. Smith. But he knew that, and that was sort of... So I said uh, to my colleagues, I said, look, I want to sit down, I want to have dinner with this guy. And I want to get to know him a little bit, and I want him to get to know me a little bit, and have a conversation that will get us to a better place, if we can. And they said, oh, that's very risky, Premier, you know. <laughs> I don't know. The bureaucrats would not no, want no, that. No, 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 you know. And I said, well, I know, I want to try it. So we did, we had dinner together. And... Um, I discovered a lot of things about him as a person. He was a cancer survivor. Uh, and my brother, at that time, my younger brother, had just passed away from cancer. So we were talking about life and 
how things you know happen and how you think it's going to work one way or another. He lived on his farm in Wisconsin a lot of the time. Very much a self-made kind of guy in his attitudes and the way he was looking at things. And I was trying to explain to him a little bit about what we wanted to do, which was to try to give the employees a chance to get a stake in the company. And he, his eyes lit up and said, that'll be okay. I said, well, you know, it's a start. And he then saw the benefit reputationally for the company to say, well, we're, we don't want this facility, but we will do this and we won't sell it to a competitor and blah, blah, blah. blah, blah. So a lot of things started to happen. And then we, you know, I said, look, I'm not here to discuss price or anything of that kind, but let's, let's, let's establish a better relationship where if you have a problem, you come to me, and if I have a problem, you know, I'll go to you directly and we'll try, we'll try to get it done. We got it done. I mean, it wasn't, wasn't, it wasn't a, not there were no bumps, but, you know, you sort of see the guy on the other side doesn't have horns. He saw that I apparently didn't have any horns. Uh, and there was an effort to say, well, let's, let's try to work our way through this. Let's try to get to the other side of this. Um, I know a lot of you students, I'm sure, and others are interested in sports. Well, we had an issue with the National Basketball Association. They, Toronto wanted a franchise. And <coughs> we, we were approved for a franchise. The question was then going to be, well, where does it go and how do we do it? And, and it's, we had a lot of it. We, we have sports line betting. And the NBA had a policy that said we're, we can't come to a jurisdiction that has sports line betting. Uh, and I, I said to the head of the NBA, you know, I said, well, you know, we're not, we're, that's a source of revenue for the province. We, we're not actually that flush at the moment. We, we do it with one way to be able to keep you know, the thing going and manage it in other ways. And he said, well, Premier, that's our policy. You're not taking any of it. I said, well, you know, let's, let's have a conversation. So can we come up here? So he came up. And I said, you know, so we, were, we met with the officials and we talked to him. That's this is going great. So I said, well, let's have, let's, let's, let's have dinner. So we had dinner with three or four of us together. And um, Larry Bertuzzi, who's a well-known negotiator and, and uh, player representative, was, was helping us out. Joe Halstead, who worked for the city, was helping us out. Uh, worked for the province at that time, went on to work for the city. And uh, we had a meeting, and um, we found solutions. We said, well, create the foundation, and we set aside some funds here for hospitals, and set aside some funds here for this. And at the press conference, he <laughs> said it's the first time I've ever, it's ever, I've ever had to pay for a franchise. The first time the NBA has ever paid something. <laughs> and, I, you know, and I said, well, it's the first time we've given up a, you know, we agreed to drop the basketball from, from, the, from the betting. Well, then, of course, the next day, Bettman phones me up and says, well, what about us? I said, Gary, look, you know, you know, there's never a condition of your playing here, so we're not going to get into this. But my point is, is that you need to try to think a little bit uh, about how, how can we be more creative about finding solutions? And how can we uh, take, you know, what is looks like a, a really terrible confrontation and turn it into something that's going to be going to be better and more productive. You've had a career of being a masterful, very skillful in terms of developing and sustaining good relationships. I mean, you just gave a couple of examples just there. But as you look back over your career and you look forward, the elements of trust. How do you develop trust with the other side? What are some of the examples of what not to do if you're trying to develop trust on the other side? Well, I think one of the problems is that sometimes people see a negotiation as uh, a way of taking short-term advantage of the other guy. You know, like you know, people will say, "Well, I really screwed him." You know, way to go. You know, I I, may, I got I got a better deal out of that than he did. The thing that you have to think about is really this really. I see it in two, in, in two big ways. One of them is your reputation. Uh, your reputation follows you wherever you go. How you behave stays with you. And you are known as either somebody that can be trusted or somebody that can't be trusted. You're either known as somebody whose word is good and, and 
Yeah, and that becomes known very quickly. Very, uh, very quickly. People know. They say, well, you know, you, you can shake hands with this guy or you can't shake hands with this guy. You know, forget shaking hands, you know. It's got to be down in writing and then and then. The second thing is, is if you're trying to develop a relationship with that person over time, it doesn't make any sense to take advantage of them in a short-term way. One of my best friends, who's a great negotiator, real estate uh, expert, and, uh, very, very remarkable man, very good friend of mine, Jack Rabinovich, uh, said to me a long time ago, he said, you know, when I negotiate, I always leave something on the table because it's more important to leave something on the table to make the other guy feel that you haven't completely fleeced him because you're going to want to do business with that person again and for the reputational issues that are, that are there. Yeah. And so I, I think that a lot of our commercial culture tends to look at bargaining as a way of taking a short-term advantage without any really thinking through what is the longer-term implication of that for your own reputation in business or in politics or in life. And I, I really think that's, that's a, you know, that's a, it's an obvious lesson for, for me. It's always been a, a bit of, a, a, bit of a, a marker, you know. What has been your normal routine uh, if you are negotiating either for your government as leader or as a, the leader of the party or representing a, a particular interest group, what, what, what was your normal routine in terms of how you prepare your approach to being prepared for that negotiation? I really want to know the history. I'm a historian by early training, and I'm still a hist I still think historically. I want to know historically about the person or the people that I'm dealing with. I want to know about what they did and have done, and I want them to know that I know. Why is that so important? Because it's a way of treating people with respect. It's a way of saying, I have, I have taken the trouble to learn more about you, and I want to understand some of the things you've done before, because that will help me to understand what you're likely to do in any given situation. I also want to know more and understand better what is the, his, what is the memory, what is the historical memory of the people that I'm dealing with. What do they know about and what have they been through before that will help them to understand what they're facing today in terms of making change and how change can happen? Second thing is, is, is really understand the economics and the politics and the background. Just know, just, just read, read as much as you can, ask questions, and get as much help as you can in having a real background for the discussion that you're getting into. Because it will always be more complicated than you think and more complicated than many of your advisors will tell you. And it requires a, uh, an appreciation of all of those things to kind of get to where you, you need to get to. And I, I, I think that's, <coughs> that's been part of my approach. And it's, I guess it's, some people say it's a bit, maybe it's a bit academic or something, but I mean, I find it really helpful to, to really feel. And also it helps, you, you can't rely on others for your expertise. You can draw on them, but you've got to know as much about the file as just about anybody in the room, and that helps you get to an answer. Well, I mean, I mean, if if you if, if you take the work I'm doing now, for example, uh, on First Nations issues, which um, I've kind of been involved in since my earliest days in politics, I was an MP when. Um, when the Shapiro wanted to repatriate the Constitution, and, and one of the first groups to respond to that was, was the First Nation, Aboriginal leadership in the country. And, and I didn't, I mean, I knew Canadian history, and I, you know, I, I was a lawyer, so I'd done some, read the cases and stuff, and I, but I hadn't really thought it through and hadn't really spent time. So I did spend a lot of time reading and talking with the leadership at that time. 
and try to understand where they were coming from and what they were trying to do, and some of their resentments and concerns. And I've spent now the better part of my adult life sort of in and out of those discussions. And I mean, Aboriginal negotiations have a particular feel to them. They they take a longer time because time is is there's a different concept of time within First Nations communities. They're not in that much of a hurry as some other people are, and they don't see life in particularly only in commercial terms. Uh, they're looking at it in a different at a different pace and in a different way, and you have to be respectful of that. And understand it. Understand it well. You know, and I'm constantly, you know, dealing with this reality with governments who have their own sense of time, and then businesses have another sense of time. And so you really got to say, well, how do we bring all these things together so that there is a, 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 an ample room for uh, for respect? Um, I've never been in negotiation with the Rock of the Park. I, I've never, never done that. I haven't had that. I haven't had that good fortune. Uh, it all takes. It all takes time. Yeah, I mean, it's, and, and, and it, it pays off. I mean, I can tell you, I mean, one of my favorite uh, experiences in that regard was a great trial lawyer, you know, probably the greatest trial lawyer in the 20th century in, in, in Canada, was a, a, a man called John Ray Robert Hutt. He was a lawyer at the Tyson. And I was once visiting a friend who was the partner at the Tyson. And I went by Mr. Robert Hutt's office. And the door was open, and he was sitting at his desk, and the desk was completely sitting. And my friend said, Would you like to come in and see the other? I said, You know, I'm just going to be able to do the other side. I said, I'm going to have to be on back in the court. And I just think that I'm going to be close to the other And he said, Well, Mr. Ray, I said, You know, you may be wondering why my desk is sitting there to do it. I'm not going to be able to do that. 